When I put on this uniform, I drive to the ballpark every day. This just feels like I've been doing it for a long time. Since joining the team in 2009, Jeremy Affelt has been an integral part of the Giants' bullpen. Got him. Oh, that's a good hook right there. You know, I don't start, I don't throw seven innings, I don't hit homers, I don't steal bases. I got to come in for those one or two innings or one or two batters and make the best pitches possible. Got him. With the third lowest ERA in postseason history, Jeremy's dominance during the playoffs cannot be overlooked. First the pitch. He struck it out swinging. Uh, this is my third experience in uh, Cincinnati. This one looks like there's a lot more smiles than my other two. Uh, <laughs> My first one was when I played here and we lost almost 100 games. There wasn't a lot of smiles around Cincinnati. My second one was in 2012. Uh, you guys were all smiles until we hurt your feelings in the NLDS and took three games straight from you. <laughs> Went on to win the world championship. We got a really nice ring out of it. Uh, so we, I, on the behalf of the San Francisco Giants, thank you and the fans and all the athletes that tanked the series to let us go on. Appreciate that. So. Allows me to come up here and talk and, and, and feel good about myself, my chest up a little bit more than it was. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, 22 years of age, I made it to the major leagues. Uh, it, it was a great experience for me. I accomplished a dream because in, at 12 years of age, I was sitting in the Oakland Coliseum. It was one of my first baseball games that I ever got to see, uh, watching the Oakland A's. And my favorite pitcher that I used to watch on TV was Dave Stewart, so I, he was pitching that day, and so my dad got, got us some really good seats, like right in the lower part of the stadium. And the, you, you're right with all the players. I mean, they look mad. I mean, all my favorite guys are there, Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco, Dave Stewart. You're just looking at all these guys, and you're looking around, Connie Lansford, you're looking at all these guys, you're like, man, they are massive. Well, they're m massive for a reason that we now know why. They, they're a little bigger than they probably should have been. Uh, <clears throat> they weren't drinking protein shakes, I can promise you that. Uh, but, uh, but they were still big and gigantic, and it was just, a, just an awesome thing to see. And I remember looking at my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm going to play here one day. And he looked at me and goes, what? I said, I'm going to play here. I'm going to be a Major League Baseball player. He said, you're, you're going to be a Major League Baseball player? I said, yes, sir. I said, I'm going to play on that field. And he patted me on the head like all good dads do and says, go for it, kiddo. And uh, he didn't put me in any baseball camps. He just let me go play baseball. And uh, then when I was 22 years of age, I walked into the Coliseum through center field where the bus dropped us off and I got my little Nokia phone out. And you guys remember that Nokia phone, man? It had like the snake game, like 1379, all the other, some of you generation, your iPhone generation. Well, my generation, our game was the worm game and you had to chase this little dot around in a circle and you had to do it so many times and try not to hit your tail end, you know? And all we had was one, three, seven, nine. We didn't draw on a screen. So it, it was kind of, it was a fun game and you got mad and you could actually throw that phone down and the screen didn't break. It was sweet, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> I got out my Nokia phone and I said, hey dad. Uh, I called my dad and, and he answered and he still has a telephone. He still today has a landline, it's impressive. And I said, uh, I said, dad, I said, you know where I'm at? He said, yeah, you're in Oakland. I said, yeah, you, you remember what happened here in Oakland? He said, what are you talking about? I said, Dad, I see the very seats we were sitting in when I was 12 years old, and I said I was going to pitch here. And tonight, Dad, I pitch in Oakland. And it hung up the phone. And I looked at my phone, and I was like, man. I, so I hit talk again. And my mama answered the phone. I said, Mama, I said, what happened? I was talking to Dad. He's like, he's crying. <laughs> uh, he's a military guy, man. He, he dropped bombs for a living. They don't cry, you know? So he didn't want to hear me. So he, he said, he's crying. He just, he's just so pumped that you accomplished your dream. And... And he, he just couldn't, he didn't, want, he didn't want you to hear him cry. And I was like, all right, well, tell him I'm here, man, and I'm excited. And that's when I kind of realized what I had done. I had accomplished a dream. In four years, I hated the game of baseball. I hated it. Absolutely hated Major League Baseball. Didn't want any, any part to do with it. It was miserable. And the problem was, is it's a very lonely feeling when you hate doing what you do for a living, especially Major League Baseball. Because if I'm gonna go to you, and I say, hey, man, uh, what do you do? And you tell me what you do, whatever, you know, zookeeper or zoo york or whatever, you know, you got the shirt on. So, you know, so, so I, it is a zoo, by the way, you're right. So, so you know, and, and, and I said, why well, play Major League Baseball and I hate it. 
I'm sure you would be like, dude, I totally understand the feeling. I would hate it too if I played Major League Baseball, man. It's just, it would stink so bad, man. I, mean, just, I, I just don't even know why you'd even want to do that for a living. You know, like I didn't have anybody I could tell that I hated the game of baseball. And it was super scary for me too, because I, I, I was like, man, I don't, I don't have anybody I can talk to. No one's going to relate to me. And I'm kind of, I feel like alone on an island here. And, and, I, and, and, and I don't know who I can, I don't even know what I'm doing on this planet right now. Why am I in baseball? What am I called to do? God, why do you have me do this? Groundhog's Day. I go to the field, I get booed, I get cheered. I go to the field, get booed and booed some more. And then I get cheered a little bit. You know, I played with Kansas City in the early 2000s. We got booed a lot. So think Cincinnati now, think that like every year. Okay, right? So, <laughs> so it was just miserable, right? Like it was just a tough deal. And, and, and I remember sitting on my counter crying. I wanted to go home, I, but my wife wouldn't let me quit because she's like, you know you can't quit. And you know as an athlete, you're not gonna do well if you quit. You gotta run this gauntlet, play it out. I'm, I'm here for you. And she was here for me, and, and, and I but I was just so frustrated with doing terrible. I got put on the DL one time for a broken fingernail. That's how it was going, okay? So it was a really bad deal. So it was, it was just a miserable time, and I was begging God in 2006, I'm like, please trade me. Either trade me or release me, because if you release me, I'm gonna take the uniform off, I'm gonna go home and say I gave it my best try. I didn't quit. I said, but if I can't get, if you're not gonna release me, God, then you gotta trade me, because I gotta get out of Kansas City, because it's making me miserable to be here. I hate going to work every day. And five minutes before the trade deadline, on July 31st, 2006, I got a call from my GM. He said, I've just traded you to Colorado Rockies. And I was like, oh, awesome. oh, that's, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, man, God, sorry it didn't work out. You know, Dayton, man, I just tried. It just, you know, I know what you had to do. You got to do the best for the team. And I hope you got somebody for me, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and then I told my wife, my wife said, what's going on? I said, I just got traded. And she starts screaming. And I was like, hey, honey, the GM's still on the phone. <laughs> back, 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 back it down a little bit, you know? And she's like, I don't care. I'm packing your bags. This is awesome. <laughs> So I'm like, all right. So she's packing my bags and I go to the field and she meets me at the airport and we're flying into Colorado and I'm flying in. My wife still has to get our dog and stuff packed up. So she stayed back. And as we're landing, I realized that there's no gravity in Colorado, right? <laughs> and if you understand how, what happens in baseball, like when it gets hit in the air, it's supposed to come down. If it doesn't, it's a homer. Well, it doesn't ever come down in Colorado, right? So you, you, you try, in fact, the first guy I faced was named Prince Fielder. And uh, I threw this curveball. And first pitch I ever threw in Colorado, threw a curveball, hit it for a homer. And all I heard was, welcome to Colorado, from the, welcome to Colorado, from the crowd. I mean, this it was getting worse for me, right? It just was not good. And I remember I was staying in my hotel, and I got up that morning, and the, and the mermaid was calling to me, right? I was like, ooh, I got to get a Starbucks, you know? And so I was going towards the Green Mermaid. Uh, and and I, was, I was just walking down the street, just remember how miserable I am. I'm like, I literally... First pitch I throw, I give up a homer. I'm just, I, I don't want to, I just, if failure, 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 it's nonstop failure. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. And I was just begging for a way I could not, it's like God was keeping me in prison and laughing at me by getting me traded to Colorado at the same time because I obviously wasn't very specific on my prayer. <laughs> and so <clears throat> uh, be specific when you ask him for stuff, okay? <laughs> So, so I remember sitting there and I see this girl sitting, uh, right, I'm at this street corner. And I see this girl sitting across the street and she's kind of sitting in front of this Rite Aid and the Starbucks right next to it, right? And, and she's got this cup of noodles in her hand, dry cup of noodles, no water. She's just eating this cup of noodles. So I walk across the street and I kind of stop and I look down at her and she's got a split lip, black guy, torn jeans. She did not have a good night the night before, trembling. And there's a lot of street kids in Denver, right? There's a lot for what they congregate there. And, uh, and I just, I just kind of reached down and I touched her on her shoulder and she jumped away from me and I said, hey, I don't want anything from you. I just want to know if you want something to eat. And she said, yes, please. So I went into Starbucks and I got that green sludgy drink, naked, says on it. It's like, looks really bad, tastes, tastes pretty good, right? Just looks like algae, right? So I'm like, I think I need that for sure. And, and then I need whatever has the most sugar. And so she handed me a blueberry muffin. Another fact, fun fact, blueberry muffins have the most sugar in Starbucks, according to the employees. So they handed me a blueberry muffin. So I walk out, <clears throat> hand it to the girl, and she looks up and rips the bag from me. 
And she looked, and she, she looked at me and said, thank you. And I stared down at her, and it was probably about five or six seconds. It felt like 30 minutes. And it's like our, we met, we locked eyes, and our, it's like we connected in an amazing way. I just stared at that girl, and she wasn't saying thank you for the food. She was saying, thank you for letting me know I exist. Because when we see homeless people, a lot of times we get the fake phone call or temporarily deaf or we randomly blind and we can't see them or, or we'll go on the other side of the street because it's an awkward deal, right? Like, like it can be awkward. We, we, we've all been in the cities where homeless people are around and it, it kind of feels weird, it feels awkward and it doesn't feel safe. And, and, and when she said that, see, I wear nice clothes. I was living in a five-star hotel I went to an unbelievable office called a baseball stadium. I had a wife, I had a home. I didn't have problems with bills. I, knew, I ate at nice restaurants. And I looked at that girl and she didn't have nice clothes. She didn't have a job. She didn't have anywhere to live. Yet our realities were the same because we were both lost, we were both lonely, we were both scared and, we, and neither of us had anyone to talk to about our current state. And I remember when she said thank you, it was thank you for letting me know I existed. And that was something I needed so bad at that moment, was to be able to be something for somebody because I didn't feel like I was being anything for anybody. And I needed God to encourage me. And he traded me and he put me in front of that girl that day for a reason because it changed my life. If you flip open my baseball card, my baseball card, the numbers all of a sudden get really good. And I'm not saying he, he all of a sudden just started blessing me I think it was always there. My talent was always there. My ability to succeed was always there. I just didn't have a reason to do it. I didn't have that, 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 that desire to why I was a baseball player. What was I a baseball player for? What was I gifted to be a Major League Baseball for? Because if it was to be just a Major League Baseball player, if my giftings were just to be a professional athlete, it didn't make a whole lot of sense because I'm not bringing a lot of impact to anybody. Except for I'm entertaining America for $12 beer, you know, which is cheap nowadays, in the baseball stadiums and a $30 ticket and $25 parking ticket to park. And, and they boo me. And that's what I'm here for. I, that's not what I want to do. So I went to the field that day and I felt so amazing sitting in the bullpen. I said, this is, why do I feel good? For the first time in like four years, I don't feel depressed to play the game of baseball. And I went to my hotel room that night and I did what I never told, my, I told myself I'd never do. I became the guy that just stuck his fingers in the Bible and just like opened it up and thought God would talk. Like, I'm, you, hey, some of you had done it. Like, <laughs> you know, and then you're like looking down, you know? And I've tried it multiple times. It's never really worked. <clears throat> but, cause then you open it up and all of a sudden it's like death becomes you. And you're like, oh, that's great. You know, that's what I needed. You know, you get all these awkward verses being thrown at you, you know? And so you're like, I don't really know what that means. So, so, <clears throat> so I, I did it again. Cause I, I was that like, desperate and I, and I, and it worked for the first time ever. It was like, God knew he's like, you know what? I'm not going to laugh at him this time. I'm actually going to help him out. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and it was Matthew 25. No joke or it separates the sheeps and the goat when he comes back. And the guy says, well, how do I know if I'm a sheep and a goat? And he says, well, when you do the least of what you've done, to, whatever you do the least of these you do to me. He's like, well, how do I know if I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do? He's like, well, have you ever, if you don't, if you don't, you know, if, if you don't visit me in prison or you don't feed me when I'm hungry or if you don't feed, give me something water when I'm thirsty, you didn't, you didn't help me out. So you're not in. And he's like, how do I know if I did that? He goes, whatever you did it, to someone who is in prison, to someone who is hungry, to someone who is naked, to someone who is in need. And if you do it for any of them, you'll do it for me. And I remember what I did for that girl. And I remember my heart was so pure when I did it for that girl. And I felt so good. It was like I fed Jesus that day and he fed me back. And he changed my life. And I finally understood Luke where it says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. They are the same. And when I'm hungry, I want something to eat. When I'm thirsty, I want something to drink. And when I want to go live somewhere, I go to my house, right? And when I'm naked, I'm definitely gonna to want to put on clothes, unless it's Cincinnati, then it's, you're tempted, 
you know, to just walk around naked. It's way easier. It's a lot cooler, you know? So, you know, so you get all these, you know, you know and, and, and I remember feeling that and just God just saying, Jeremy, this is what I want you to do. I want you to use baseball as a platform. Your success will only be the success that I want it to be if you can encourage others and show others and give others the opportunity to have success. And I said, how do I do that? Do to the least of these what they need done and, and give them a chance to be able to look at their dad or mom one day and say, one day I'm gonna be. Because everybody deserves the opportunity to say, I'm one day I'm gonna be. And everybody who has ever said one day I'm gonna be that has had some hard times come where they weren't able to achieve it deserve a chance to still achieve it. And I started an organization called Generation Alive right after that. And it dealt with young people in poverty. And we now go into schools and we have these action teams in these public schools, public high schools. And the only reason I'm, ha I'm able to get into half of them is because of what I did for a living. And I go in and we start these action teams. And we basically tell kids to understand what poverty looks like in your community. What does poverty look like? What are the pains that poverty causes? And how can we alleviate those pains through acts of compassion? And it's not feeling bad for the person, it's actually putting it to action. So you don't look at someone that's struggling and being, man, that sucks, keep walking. Or too bad for them. Or use the religious jargon, right? I'll pray for you. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, most people won't do it. Yeah, I'll pray for you. Uh-huh, okay, I'll come back next week and I'll ask what your prayer was. Because we don't really know what to say, right? Compassion is actually doing it. When Jesus hung on the cross, he, had, he even created an act of compassion. When he fed 5,000 people, there were acts of compassion. So I started an organization that did that, and we've, in the last five years, we've fed over two and a half million people. No. And kids have had to, yeah, and kids have had, and all youth have had to raise the money. All kids have had to raise the money, it's 25 cents a meal. We also help rescue women out of human trafficking and create backpacks that have their personal things that they need when they get rescued. And they, 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 they share the love of Jesus with other people, and they feed people they don't even know because it's a simple act of compassion, because in every community there's hunger, in every community there's trafficking. And now kids are finding other, now our action teams are actually finding other areas that there is poverty and what is the pain that poverty causes, and they're creating their own ideas. It's very, very amazing. And I had a kid come up to me and say, why, do, why does this feel so good? And I said, are you asking me the question? Because if you ask me the question, I'm in a public school. So I said, if you ask me the question, I can give it to you. So you asking me why you feel so good? They said, yeah, why does it feel so good to do this? I said, because that's the love of Jesus. And the kid looked at me, right? And I said, it's unconditional love. And we're all built for it, and we're all born with it. We just have to find it. So my loneliness came from the fact that I didn't know who I was, and I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. And I got very lonely in, in an area that most people would think you were not lonely. And it took a young girl on the street to be able to change my, my thought process, and God put her there. And for the rest of my career, I was not lonely. I was very fulfilled. Three rings to prove it, just saying. But uh, I'm messing with you. <clears throat> I'm messing with you. I got an extra two minutes, so I thought I'd make a joke. Uh, so I just, but I just wanted to tell you, I said, I, I've, been, I've been very fulfilled in what I did. And I know why I played, and I had my why. And, and, and I know who I am, and I know what I played for, and I still do it to this day. And I love sharing the love of Jesus through acts of compassion. And that's how I found who I was. And I got to tell my dad at 12 years old, one day I'm gonna be, and I got to accomplish that. And when I retired, I, when I retired, my dad was on the field on my retirement speech, and I hugged my dad, and I said, Dad, one, you gave me the chance to say one day I'm gonna be, and I'm hugging you because I got to tell you that I'm happy that I became it. And I'm a better man for it, and I've got more to do. And it was because of the platform that you gave me by encouraging me, and I found my place in Jesus and my identity in Christ and now I can give to others and love other people. God bless you. Thank you for letting me hear you.